All right, g'day guys. Welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel as we slowly eke towards the 2022 AFL season. As such, it's time to start sort of teasing out that preview content for what is hopefully a good season ahead. Of course, it's going to have its own complications yeah, with COVID and the like, but as best as possible, I try and ignore that side of things when looking at the season ahead. In today's video, I'm going to be taking a look at 10 players across the league that I'm particularly excited to watch. And I guess you could say they're players to look out for this year. In most of these instances, they're players who, you know, have already somewhat established in the league, but I think could really take the next step in 2022 and take their game up a level, so to speak. Compiling this list, it's, it's a little bit arbitrary, of course. You could, I'm sure you could nominate, you know, two to three players on every list that you could make the argument will take their game to the next level this year. It does happen across the league somewhat. And of course, this is subjective opinion. So I've just sort of come up with 10 players that I'm particularly keen to watch, but I'm sure that you guys in the comments could come up with you another 40 to 60 in the league. Before I crack into the content of this video, as always guys, check out the sponsors of the True Footy YouTube channel, manscaped.com, where you can get 20% off and free shipping on all of their great products. I know that they have some new lines coming out, which is definitely worth taking a look at. So if you want to keep up your manscaping routine to an elite level, do go check out manscaped.com. Also, while I've got you, it appears that about 40% of the people who have been watching my videos over the summer are still not subscribed to the channel. So if you could take the time to subscribe to this channel, and if you are enjoying the content, it would mean a lot to me. So thanks guys. But enough of the waffle, let's crack into this list. And in no particular order, these are 10 players that I think will take their game to the next level this season. So first on the list, I'm going to start with Port Adelaide's Zach Butler who is already a tremendously talented player, well-known player across the league, and he's already a very important player to Port Adelaide as well. He's super skillful and damaging, and he sort of already plays, you know, well beyond his years. He looks like a mature player out there, and as such has been an important player for Port Adelaide during a relatively successful period over the last few years. Fortunately for him, he's just battled a bit of injury. He only managed 12 games last season, uh, but this year he's publicly come out and said that he intends to be a full-time midfielder for Port Adelaide this season, whereas previous he's been kind of playing in a high half forward role but of course he spends more time on ball you know potentially he's getting five to ten more possessions a game and that's where I think he could really sort of elevate himself into all Australian discussions. Port Adelaide sort of got a little bit of a transition on the agenda you know they've drafted heavy in terms of the young talent on their list I think it stacks up really really well and they of course have some really gun veterans in particular Travis Boak so they kind of need a bit of a contingency plan what does the team look like with Travis Boak uh, gone in a couple of years perhaps I think think Zach Butters is a really important player and really important part of that. I genuinely think there's a chance that he could establish himself as close to Port Adelaide's best player this year. So first player on the list, Zach Butters. Next up, we are going with a particularly popular choice, Cam Rayner, who's a former number one pick who has accumulated 63 games at AFL level, but hasn't quite sort of ever got enough momentum to really establish himself as a potential A grader yet. Of course, he missed all of last season with that ACL injury, which is an unfortunate time for him at a point where he's probably ready to take his game to the next level. Over the last couple of years where he's played full seasons, he hasn't averaged more than 10 possessions a game, but being a number one draft pick that he was, and you know, coupled with the fact that he's probably played in a bit more of a forward role, kind of protecting him a little bit, I think there is plenty of upside there, and another player who's probably been earmarked for some more midfield time this season in Brisbane's midfield. He appears to be in really good nick, playing in the match team, and I guess you could read reports about, you know, clubs intra-club performances and their pre-season games, and you have to take it with a grain of salt, but I think if he is genuinely fit and he does get that more midfield time that he's been earmarked for. He's a very high impact player. So if he starts getting 20 possessions a game, that's another player who will take his game to the next level. Bucking the trend a little bit, I'm actually going to go with the first year player here. Last year's number one draft pick, Jason Horn Francis, who of course joined North Melbourne through the draft this year. He's a special number one pick. There were several clubs who offered a multitude of picks and particularly in the first round to secure his services. From memory, Richmond offered, you know, pick seven, a couple of picks in the 20s and Cameron Col Coleman Jones. I, I might have even been three picks in the 20s. Correct me if I'm wrong there. Adelaide also had a big crack at him, understandably being the South Australian talent that he is. But we're talking about a kid here who is pretty proven against, you know, mature bodies already. He was playing seniors at the age of 17 in the Sandfall, kicked three goals in a prelim, if I remember correctly, and he's a really exciting, explosive type, and he plays with a great intensity defensively as well. So I genuinely think he's going to have an immediate impact at AFL level, regardless of how you think North are going to go this year. Played pretty well in the practice match against the Demons as well, from all reports, and it's cliche to pick the number one pick, uh, you know, to win the rising star, but I think this kid will make an impact. He's proven against mature bodies. I don't think that step up's going to be too big for 
for him, and I can see him having a big impact in his first season. Next, we're going to go with another Brisbane line, Zach Bailey, and I've picked two Brisbane lines here, so that should perhaps forecast a pretty good year for them, you'd think. He kind of made a name for himself last year. You know, People already know who Zach Bailey is. He kind of had a breakout season of sorts. He was drafted as an inside mid back in, I think, 2016, 2017. He's accumulated 70 games for the club, and he's already a pretty good forward midfielder. Last year, he averaged 18 possessions a game and a 1.3 goals a game, but he had multiple bags of four in that, showing that he's genuinely dangerous around goals. He's another player that's been earmarked for the midfield, and I think if he does get more exposure in the guts, then he will genuinely take his game to the next level. If he starts averaging, you know, 24, 25 possessions a game and is hitting the scoreboard with the same sort of regularity, then we're talking about a genuine gun of the competition here, and I think he could sort of become a bit of a Toby Green type. As such, I don't think this guy should actually play as a full-time on-baller. I think if you've got a forward mid who genuinely has forward craft, which he appears to, then he's not the sort of player I would chuck in the guts and then push Lockie Neal forward. But regardless, I think Zach Bailey is going to have an enormous season. Next up, we're going a little bit cliche here with Matthew Rout from the Gold Coast Suns. Of course, he was a number one draft pick back at the end of 2019 and took the competition by storm in the early parts of the shortened season in 2020, where I think he had three three-vote Brownlow games in his second, third, and fourth games. And he just had an incredible immediate impact and probably not the sort of impact I've ever seen from an 18-year-old midfielder. He won plenty of football, accumulating, you know, 20-odd disposals in shortened quarters. He hit the scoreboard as well, kicked a couple against West Coast, unfortunately. Laid a heap of tackles as well. He laid 10 tackles in, in one of those games as well. And he, he just hasn't found his groove since. Of course, he had a massive injury, shoulder reconstruction in 2020, missed most of that year. Did his, uh, I think it was his PCL or a knee injury in round one of 2021. And probably a combination of you know, being injury prone, probably a bit of media pressure as well because of the notoriety he received and probably a factors of confidence and general fitness as well sort of held him back from achieving that greatness last year but talent doesn't go away and if he is raring to go this year I think he's going to have a big impact for the Gold Coast Suns. The next player I'm keen to watch is Carlton's Adam Chera who's one of the big trade names to move to clubs last year, traded from Fremantle for pick six in return. He's a classy smooth midfielder, uses the ball really well, sort of and one of those cliche Pendlebury types who seems to have a little bit more time than his opponents uh, when he's sort of getting the ball out of traffic and he, he uses the ball well as well, which makes him really dangerous. A little bit understated perhaps at Fremantle and understandably so when you've got Andy Brayshaw and Caleb Sarong who were probably better than him during that period at Fremantle. That being said, I think he's got a lot of potential in his own right and I'm intrigued to see what he will do in a Carlton midfield where he probably has a little bit more responsibility in that team as well. The boys will be looking at a front three sort of midfield of Cripps, Walsh and Cherry and they might think that's probably the best you know, three midfield combo that they've had in a number of years now. So I know Walsh is injured for the first part of the season, but I'm interested to see how Chera goes as a primary on-baller for that club. Next, we'll talk about Jai Caldwell from the Essendon Footy Club, who in my opinion is a tremendously talented player. And he sort of threatened to show that talent in the early stages of 2020, 2021, sorry. He crossed from the Giants at the end of 2020 and he's played early in the season for Essendon. Unfortunately, just as he was starting to find his groove and have an impact at AFL level, he he had an unfortunate injury. So he's only played three games for that footy club, but I genuinely think with more exposure and a bit more of a crack in the midfield for Essendon this season, we're going to see the sort of talent that Jai Caldwell is. So he's definitely one to watch for me this season. Next up, I'm going to nominate the oldest player on this list. Is by no means a young player in Jesse Hogan from the GWS Football Club. He's had a really up and down journey, hasn't he, Jesse Hogan? He was a prodigious talent, a sort of taken in the mini draft the year before he was even eligible to the Melbourne Football Club. Had some great football there. I think it was 26. 17, he had a fantastic season, booting 40-odd goals. Then he requested a trade home to Fremantle, and of course, we all know that that didn't go so well, and he was quite uh, a little bit scathing, actually, about the Fremantle experience that he had. But he's now back over east at GW West this time. And to be honest, I thought from what I saw from Jesse Hogan last year, there is plenty of talent still to work with there. He kicked eight goals in his first two games last year, and he bobbed up. I think he had 19 goals across nine games last year in a side that was, you know, openly inconsistent last season. They're a team that desperately needs a key forward target with Jeremy Cameron having parted ways with him, you know, some 12 to 18 months ago. He's going to get plenty of looks at it. And I think that GWS team could bob up and surprise a few this year. And I think there's plenty of ability in that back half and that midfield. So if they can deliver the ball well to Jesse Hogan, and if he can stay on the park, I think he's genuinely a good chance of kicking 40 to 50 goals this year. And if he does, then you could probably watch out for GWS this season as well. For him, it's about staying on the park, to be honest. And if he does, I'll back him in to have a good season this year. The ninth player I'll nominate is another Carlton footballer on this list. It's Charlie Kerno this time and 
I know we might be a little bit fatigued at all the Charlie Kono hype because, you know, for the number of years, it's about how good and talented this player is, but we just haven't quite seen it on a consistent basis. And frankly, that's largely because he just cannot get fit. But he's 25 now. He's fully developed. He's probably been fully developed for a number of years now, to be completely honest. But as a key forward, his athleticism is what sets him apart. And now I sort of picture an environment where he's playing in front of a fully developed and established Harry Mackay now, who just won the common medal. They've got a two-pronged attack, which means that Kerno will probably have a little bit less pressure on him to kick goals. I can see him sort of playing higher up the ground as Mackay stays deep. So I don't know how many goals he's necessarily going to kick. But if he stays on the park, I think there's a lot of upside in his Carlton side. I know we've been saying it for years, but if he gets fit, I'm going to back Charlie Kerno in for a breakout season. And finally, the 10th player on the list I'm going to nominate is a player that you're already familiar with, Caleb Sarong, who again is a player I think really does have more to offer at AFL level. He definitely stepped up a lot last year and you could argue that was kind of a breakout of sorts, but I think he's got more in the tank and he's, he averaged 22 possessions a game last year and I think that kind of undersells what he actually produced last year. I think for the most of the first half of the season, he was sort of averaging around the teens mark, but then he, the last half of the season, he went 30, 20, 26, 20, and then ended the season with 30, 31, and 35 possession games. So a clear sort of breakout from what he was previously doing. And off the top of my head, I can't really remember, but I think it was a case of maybe a bit more midfield exposure around some injuries, Fife and Mundy sort of stepping back now. With no Cherry in that midfield too, I think a lot of responsibility will lay on the shoulders of Andy Brayshaw and Caleb Sarong. And I genuinely think Caleb Sarong is capable of being an All-Australian midfielder this year. So that's my case of why he's going to take his game to the next level. He's already a good player, but he could genuinely be an A grader this year. But anyway, guys, that's my list of 10. I did have to whittle it down. There's a number of players that, uh, you know, I could have made a strong case for being in this list, but this is just my subjective sort of list that I am excited to see this year. Let me know in the comments who from your club I missed out, as you always do, which is great. Like I said, I'm sure you can make a strong case for some more deserving names being on this list, but I'll stand by the list. I think these players are going to potentially have really, really good seasons. But thank you guys. Hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you've enjoyed uh, me sort of being back in this space as well, and uh, I'm sure we're all looking forward to the 2022 AFL season. Keep an eye out for the podcast. Keep an eye out for our sponsors, Manscaped, and uh, I'll see you in the next video. Thanks, guys.